All right, that was our signal to begin. Uh, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, uh, if you could join us in Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, that's what we're going to pick up with tonight. If you are joining us online, we're grateful for your presence with us. We're going to um, spend some time in prayer tonight before we get into our study. We have a couple of additions already to our prayer list. Does anyone uh, have any additions you'd like for us to add tonight? Jonathan, I don't know if uh, my brother-in-law's on there. Tommy Mosher? Yeah. Yes, he, he's on there. Okay, thank you. It's under friends and family. So just go ahead and... and uh, yeah, okay, you'll have to add it. Just add it in for tonight. He, he's in one end of the hospital and she's in the other end of the hospital. Mosher. Talk to Bob, uh, talk to Bill Wade this afternoon, and, and Carol is doing better. Jim Rogers is, is not doing well. Uh, I know we uh, we heard that he had kind of gotten a good report, but um, uh, he he's he's struggling. We need to uh, keep him in our prayers. But he and Patsy appreciate that. I reached out to Patsy. I haven't heard anything from her. Anybody else? Wayne, any in the chat room? Did you see? Uh, doesn't look like it. I do realize uh, as well tonight, if we uh, want to pray for it, that there's a lot of tornadoes going on today um, all over the, the uh, Ohio Valley, and um, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma. I mean, it's really bad today. All those in before it's everlastingly too late. Father, I thank you so much for the compassion that you have, for the healing power that you have. And these individuals, Father, had been requested us to pray for individually by name, and we are more than happy to do so. But we also realize that there may be others that are on our hearts and on our minds that you know about and I pray that you would be active in their needs and in their life as those as well as those that we're about to lay at your throne. Father, we pray for my wife Edwina and my brother-in-law Ed as the whole family pass uh, mourns the passing of Carolyn. I pray, Father, for Emily Cooper and family and the passing of her brother Wayne Church. Kevin Watson, Father, and the family and the passing of his mother, Shirley. And Father, I pray for those that are recuperating, those that are ill. Father, I pray for Myrna Bosch and Faith Carmichael. It's so good to see Kevin here this evening, Father. Gary Clark, Melba Dawes, Linda Dutton and Christy Folks, Ellen and Jean Haas and Cookie Hawthorne, Leslie Hoffman and Jackie Hunt. Father, I pray that you would continue to bless Jerry and Pam Jones, Carol Lightfoot, Rick and Biggie Ludwig, Mary McFadden and Sally Myers and Shirley Norris, Billy Preston and Kat and Ronnie Reinhardt and their family. Father, we're concerned about the news we heard this evening for Jim Rogers, and I pray, Father, that you would bless him and that family. Sandra Rollins and Doug Rutledge, Nessie Stover and family, Father, and Father, we we're, 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 are grateful for the news that we received for Carol Wade. Now, we pray, Father, you continue to bless her. Father, we pray for Bob and Charlene York. Father, we also pray this evening for Ted Bowers, for Cody Wallace, for Virginia Sheridan. Father, we, we pray for our graduation class here at Waters 
We pray, Father, that as they leave this chapter behind them and they turn to the next page, that you would bless their steps, that you would protect them, Father, from the evil one, that you would that that you would put them in in situations, Father, to where they will succeed. And Father, although there are some that are already back home, there are those that are still traveling. And Father, we pray that you would grant for them safe travels. We pray for Tommy Mosier. And Father, for the tornado victims that we've been seeing on TV, those that have lost life, those that have lost everything that they have, Father, I pray that you would help those that are reaching out to help them. I pray that you would grant them the means and the opportunity to where that they may be able to share, to help to bring their lives back to together and help them as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. Father, again, I thank you for this evening and the opportunity that you have given me and Jonathan to be able to present this lesson. Father, I so thank you for Jonathan's ability to teach and, and for his willingness to, to go into this with both of us. And I pray, Father, that as we have studied and as we have bounced stuff off of each other and we have discussed topics, Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to deliver this lesson in a way that would be easy to understand. And Father, to be able to take it and to be able to use it. And as always, Father, if we teach anything wrong, I pray that you would defeat us, Father, and not leave us there, but help both of us to be able to study even harder, understand even more to where that we might be able to present your word even, even, even clearer. We ask you now, Father, to forgive us of the sins that we've committed in our lives, that you would protect each and every one of us from the evil one. And when you call us home, Father, we pray for a peaceful passing for us all. We ask all of this in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. All right, if you... Um, Alice, do you want this back? Thank you, sir. Have your Bible or your Bible app there to Romans chapter 15. We're going to focus on verse number one tonight. Can read this to you out of the New American Standard 1995 update. Paul writes, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Well, uh, as you can see, we're um, how many chapters do we have left here, Alan? Two? I didn't know we'd ever get this far. It's only taking us how many? What's that? I said we'll be done this time next year. It's only taking us how many weeks, Jonathan? This is 159, if we've counted correctly. I trust that Wayne's kept pretty good count. Well, you know, Alan called it last week, so we kind of had class on it. <laughs> I watched it. We didn't. We didn't even study Romans. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's encouraging to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Cliff and I have talked about what we're supposed to teach next, and I don't think we even have a clue. We don't have a clue yet. All right, so we're beginning a new chapter of scripture tonight, uh, Romans chapter 15. But uh, we, we kind of talked about this, and we felt it was important um, to remind each other in this class of the amount of effort that the apostle Paul put forth. I mean, we saw in the first several chapters of this study, the effort that, that Paul put forth to establish that we are all, and when I say all, I'm talking about those uh, in the first century church at Rome, and even us today, that we are all one, body in Christ Jesus. We are one. And that that's something that Paul spent a great deal of effort to try to put forth. You know, as we have been basically saying from the beginning, when you consider the diversity of the Lord's church in Rome, specifically the, the mixture of both new converts to Christ, 
which they would have come from the Jewish background and some would have even came from the Gentile back, background. It was extremely important for Paul as he was writing this to establish that both of the groups, Jew or Gentile, began and started their journey in Christ from the same starting point. One was not ahead of the one, one was not ahead of the other. You know, we, we really established that in the first chapter. I mean, the, within the first chapter of this book, uh, that all who are in Christ, and we I went back and look at our notes from those first few. We were doing those remotely, but uh, went back to look at our notes, and we talked about how uh, in Christ we are all equally justified. Uh, we all receive uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. And we referenced that many times, uh, but Paul, you know, he wanted us to be certain of the fact that when it comes to our lives, I've heard the old phrase uh, from preachers back when I was a kid that the foot of the cross is level. Maybe you've heard that before, but the idea is that uh, none of us stands taller than another in having been credited the righteousness of Christ uh, and, and justification. The fact is, folks, in all honesty, I am, well, as a matter of fact, we all are forgiven and equally justified through the work of Jesus Christ. As I said before, none of us got a head start on our justification based on whether you have been raised in the church and you have a religious heritage or Maybe you come out of the world and therefore you have a lack of that. But it's all, all equal, as Johnson said, at the cross. And, and remember, class, we're speaking right now of justification. But please hear us on this. We are not all equal in the sense of where we are in our journey of becoming more Christ-like. Some believers are further advanced in their walk than with others. That's the reality uh, then and today. Well, and, and some are maturing at a faster pace. They're walking with a greater stride than what other <coughs> believers are. Some believers are more mature at this point than other believers. And some believers have more of a, Christ-like spirit in their dealings with others. I, I mean, class, we've seen this expressed in so many ways over the past several weeks in our study. In fact, Paul spent the majority of chapter 14, and he's going to spend a lot of this uh, chapter 15 illustrating this uh, difference. Uh, and in these two chapters, we've seen the designation of two categories of believers. Uh, let me remind you, both these categories are equally justified, yet class, let me ask you this question. We're studying this in, in Romans chapter 14. Was it the fact that everyone in the church was equal in their understanding of all the ramifications of being in Christ? Was everyone in the first century church in Rome equal in their understanding of the doctrine of Jesus Christ? No. no. Um, obviously, they were not, um, especially when we consider their growth as Christians. The church, by the way, we're still very early in the church's existence. The, the, the church of Christ, the Lord's church, is, is still an infant in terms of its history. Um, so the answer is pretty clearly no. Uh, not everybody uh, came up out of those waters of baptism and then grew at the same pace, as Cliff said, or were at this point on the same level in terms of their spiritual maturity. They're not. So Paul, what he does, he illustrates this reality within the church in Rome by putting forth that there are two categories that existed within this fellowship. They are known, and we have talked about this, the strong believers and the weak believers. Yeah, that was alluded to. Go back to Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. 
Paul says, now, except the one who is weak in faith. And of course, as we've seen over the last several weeks, that here in this opening verse, Paul is imploring the stronger believers. So the two categories are given to us right there in that first verse. We have the weak in faith and those who are strong in faith. Yeah. If you've been with us recently, uh, this is not a new concept, especially since we've been looking at this since Romans 14. The idea of the weaker brother and the stronger brother, folks, we have discussed it. We've hashed it out. We put it before you for many weeks now. In fact, this letter to the church in Rome is not the only letter of Paul's epistles where he references this differentiation within the, 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 the church. For example, if you if you have your, your Bibles, somebody uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, and somebody read that for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as a spiritual people, but to you as carnal, so as babes in Christ. So what is Paul saying there? Paul says, I want to speak to you as a stronger brother, but I'm not able to speak to you as a stronger brother. I've got to speak to you as men in flesh, as if he spoke, as if he's talking to infants in Christ. And Paul is not the only writer in the New Testament to go, hey, not everybody is at the same growth. And the Apostle John divides it out even further. He actually gives us three categories of believers, depending on where you are in your spiritual development uh, and, and grace. Look with me now, 1 John chapter 2. I want to volunteer to read this one for us. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12 and ending in verse 14. Again, 1 John chapter 2. Read from verse 12, 13, and 14. Read that for us, please, someone. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked, wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to your fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. All right. So did you pay attention to that? John identifies that some of us are children. Others are young men. Others are fathers. Now, is he just saying, oh, this is chronological, biological age? Is that what he's talking about here? No. He's talking about spiritual maturity. Some of you, in terms of your spiritual maturity, are like children. Some of you are like young men and you're growing. Some of you are like fathers and you have a, a, a certain maturity about you that is very valuable in God's kingdom. And so in our study of, of back in Romans chapter 14 and now here in Romans chapter 15, we should be well equipped by this point in our study of seeing Paul's distinction in these two ways. Those two ways are those who are strong believers and those who are weak believers. And the point that Paul begins to make in Romans chapter 14, if you will pay close attention and notice this, he will now take this to a completely higher level here in Romans chapter 15, we're looking at Romans chapter 15. This is the season, Romans chapter 15. Now, here in Romans chapter 15, he is now going to appeal to the stronger brethren to live in unity. Unity being in one with the weaker brethren that Paul is now talking to. I can't help whenever I, I read chapter 15 and, and think about what Cliff has kind of shared with us. It, it underscores to me just how valuable, how much value God uh, sees 
unity between believers or unity with between brethren. Mm -hmm. For example, can anybody quote for me Psalm 133, verse 1? Anybody know that by heart? Behold, now how good and pleasant it is for what? For brothers to dwell in unity. It's something that is very valuable to God. Jonathan, I absolutely love that verse. And if we are being honest here, folks, there's only a few things that makes the gospel more attractive to unbelievers than for them to see a unified church. I mean, for them to see a Christian fellowship where there is unity among the members. On one hand, a lack of unity, well, that can be very unattractive to an unbeliever. Whenever they see Christians that are backbiting, that jabbing one another, and not getting along, it's, it is so prevalent to the world to see that. It's almost like there's this odious smell about the church, you know, sort of like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Uh, that makes people not want to be a part of. But on the other hand, let somebody see the unity. Let somebody see Christians that love each other. That's a sweet smelling aroma that, that, that will literally bring other believers and they want to be a part of that. I think there's um, the prophet Zephaniah Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, references the idea that we are to serve God shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, that may be metaphorical, but there's really not to be these petitions and walls put up between brothers uh, in Christ. Uh, it's kind of like this room tonight. We're all kind of sitting here shoulder to shoulder. Um, and, it, and it made me think as I was writing this about right after COVID, we came back from COVID and everybody was like supposed to be out. How many feet apart was it? I mean, it didn't feel normal to be that separated from one another, did it? Because there is a value, an intrinsic value in being a part of God's family and truly being, as Zephaniah says, shoulder to shoulder with our brothers. Let me give you another one, Johnson. Look at John chapter 10 and verse 16. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Somebody read that for me again. John chapter 10 and verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock one shepherd. Folks, that's what that the word is saying that they should be one flock, the body of Christ, with one shepherd. Not which, not one um yeah this denomination flock and this denomination flock and not this and not not all these various flocks. Folks, we gotta try one. to all be one together. I mean, there's one truth. Because if we are the body of one, then who is the head of that body? Christ Jesus Christ. He is the head of this body. Yeah, John chapter 17, verse 23, right? That, that's the unity that Jesus prayed for. He said what? I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So... Now, here's I love the way he puts this because he gives what he wants and then he tells what the end result's going to be. So what? That the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. So whenever we are dwelling in unity, what message are we sending about Jesus Christ? The same. We're telling the world that Jesus Christ really is the son of God. If we're dwelling in disunity, if, if we are 
constantly biting and devouring one another. What we're really saying, well, we're not saying that that Jesus and, and God are one, because how dare we say that they're one when we're not one? We got to be consistent. We, uh, by our unity, profess that God and Jesus are one, that he truly is a son of God. And Jonathan, really and truthfully, I think all of this speaks <clears throat> to how a word that we don't use that much anymore, but I believe that it is specifically applicable here, and that's long suffering long-suffering that we should be with one another and strive to maintain that unity that the Spirit of God has produced. In fact, folks, there again, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, I want you to pay close attention to what Paul is saying here. He starts out the very first part of this verse. Now I exhort you. What's Paul doing here? Paul is absolutely to the best of his ability trying to encourage as much as he can. And he is exhorting them for what? Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's given us the foundation of, of what he is exhorting you on that you all agree and that there be no division among you, but that you may be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, folks, I did not write that. And I love the fact he says made complete. In yes. other words, that you may be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Because if everybody feels like they've been built by something else, if everybody feels like they're complete because of something else, then you're never going to be on the same page. Right. But if everybody feels like the same uh, foundation is where you're standing on, then you're going to feel more, more unity in that situation. If, if, if Satan, if, if the devil is a divider with lies and the Holy Spirit is a uniter in truth that we have a choice of who we're going to follow. We're either going to follow the spirit, which leads to unity, or we're going to follow Satan and his lies, which divide and conquer us. Ephesians 4, 3 says, preserve, be diligent to preserve the unity of a spirit in the bond of peace. And that's an interesting verse because, as we've said in this class multiple times, we don't create unity. Our job is not to create it. We are to preserve it, the unity that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus has already created. It's interesting that you brought that up because I was about to share that scripture. My version says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So it, to me, it implies that unity requires effort. It, it requires work. It's not going to be a natural thing that everybody will be going to the same church and all of a sudden they magically agree. It takes effort. And that's why Paul is, is, ex, um, is exhorting it's exhorting them to to really do everything within their power. Like I can almost picture Janice. I can almost picture him with this. This is urging. Them. Yeah, this this this, urging. this look on it. If he was looking at them, talking about it, this urging, this this passion on his face of saying, "Please, we have to do this. This is so important that we that we do this." Yeah. And, and sometimes when we have situations at home with our own families. And I realize if I'm honest with myself, that I really need every effort within my power to be at peace with my own family, to make amends with my daughter, my husband, whoever. So, yes, unity will always require effort. Yeah. Always. And Paul has been very clear whenever you look at this all through the book of Romans. That from the moment you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were placed into the body of Jesus Christ. 
And we must do everything within us by the grace of God to preserve this unity that God has created in that body of Christ. And Cliff, I don't think we can overlook Ephesians chapter four. Uh, it's all turned together there. Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse four and ending in verse six. I want to get a volunteer to, to read that for us. Ephesians chapter four, four through six. I want us to listen to this and, and consider what we're talking about here and how this affects what we're talking about. Ephesians four, Four through six. Uh, whenever someone has that, go ahead and read that for us, please. One body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. How many of you are good at nailing a nail? How many of you are good at using a hammer and putting a nail into a board? When you have like half glasses on. I mean, this verse is like somebody who's very skilled with a hammer driving a nail into a board. Paul is saying, preserve it. Do everything within your power to accept one another, to forgive one another, to be long-suffering with one another, to rejoice with one another to bear one another's burdens, that one concept, not, he didn't say there's a few uh, bodies uh, and, and, and few spirits and, and a few hopes and a few callings and a few lords and a few faiths and a few baptisms and a few gods and good few uh, fathers. No, how many does he say? Time after time, he says what? One, one, one. one. It, 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 he's stressing that there is nowhere else to turn. There is one answer to this. That we all have to buy into. Yes. The bow on that, there's seven of those ones. Seven of those ones, so a perfect number, right? Perfect completeness. Well, and Jonathan, let me give you one more. Look at Philippians chapter one, folks. Philippians chapter one. In verse 27. We're giving y'all a lot of scriptures tonight for a lot of foundation, folks, of what that Jonathan and I are saying. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Somebody read that. Philippians 1 and verse 27. Only let your conduct, conduct, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whatever I come, whenever I come to see you and am absent, I may hear your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together. For the faith and the gospel. Folks, Paul's saying here, hey, no matter where I am, I want to hear something good about you. I want to hear that you in this in this world, you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind. Not only whenever I'm with you, but whenever I am away from you. And again, class, we're, as Cliff said, we're, we're underscoring a lot here. And the purpose is that we want to make sure that all of us together can see how important it is to God that there is unity within the Lord's church. And, and we, we're doing all this set up Romans chapter 15. But before we do, let me give you one more verse myself. Colossians 3, 14. Paul says what? Beyond all these things, put on what? Look at it. Colossians 3.14, what does it say? Beyond all these things, put on what, class? Look at it. Love. Love, Love which is the perfect bond of unity. Listen, I know we've all seen the commercials. This crazy stuff that they claim will bond stuff together. You know what I'm talking about? Flex Seal and all those products. Gorilla glue. Gorilla glue. Raise your hand if you've foolishly bought that stuff before. <laughs> it didn't work for me. What were you trying to glue together? I was trying to 
fix the pipe from leaking. It's the same company. Flex seal. That didn't work. But the idea that I'm trying to give you here is there is only one thing that will bond us together. We are in Christ. The one thing that will hold us together is love. Beyond all these things, put on love. That's what holds us together in the perfect bond of unity. We are one in Christ. He is the great glue that holds us together. It is his love for us that that, that motivated him to do what he's done for us, and that, that holds together. If you're still looking at Colossians 3.14, I want to call your attention to that phrase, put on. To us, it's two words, but it's a one word verb in the Greek. It's a one word verb in the Greek, and that is similar to putting on clothes every morning when you get up. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you do. The fact is, Johnson and I could have added many, many, many more verses that we both know which prove the point of how much God values and prizes, as a matter of fact, among the believers of this unity. It's quite amazing, folks, how stress the entire Bible, as a matter of fact, places upon the ideas of brothers and sisters existing in unity. You especially have seen this if you have been in Jonathan's Genesis class on Sunday morning. If you consider what Jonathan talked to us about what happened between the first set of brothers in the Bible, you could see real quick what happens whenever there is no unity. There's disunity, I guess you could call it. All right. I think we've done enough background. We're ready for go on. So let's uh, turn our attention to this very first verse here, Romans chapter 15. Before we do, any questions, folks, before we get started? Because we think that we've covered it pretty much. Go ahead, brother. For the sake of those who take notes or are referenced here, we're going to call this, once again, it's interesting, we're going to call this Paul's exhortation, even though we've talked about Paul exhorting. He's doing that right here again because he's going to issue an exhortation in verse one. Now, here's a key that's actually going to summarize the entire 14th chapter of the book of Romans. In this first verse, he's going to give us a conclusion of the entire preceding chapter. Folks, what is the very first word in Romans chapter 15, verse 1? Now, do you see the word now? They, if they don't have a New American Standard, yeah, they probably don't, don't have see. a New American Standard. The first word in the New American Standard is now. And as we have indicated, that is the opening word for the New American Standard translation of Romans chapter 15, verse 1. And Paul opens that chapter with this word. And what this word is, it gives us some type of a summaration feel to it as we are looked back over the 14th chapter. And now Paul's going to come in and he's going to summarize chapter 14 here in chapter 15, John. All right. Paul says, now we who are strong. Class, let me make sure we understand when Paul says strong. We've said this before. We want to make sure everybody hears this again. He's referring to strong in doctrine, strong in truth, strong in conviction, strong in faith. Does Paul include himself in uh, this notation? He sure does, doesn't he? So does Paul consider himself to be a weak brother or a strong brother here? Strong brother. It's not falsely humble. To say by self-analysis, hey, God, where am I at right now? There's nothing wrong with looking at yourself and saying, God, where am I at? Am I, am I strong in, in my faith? Am I weak? Am I, where am I, God? In fact, I think that's a prayer that we ought to be willing to pray. God, help me to see where I am right now. 
and where I need to be. And then it's there's nothing wrong with giving God glory by saying, you know, God, I've seen where he's taken me from. I was this brother here and now he's matured me to this. There's nothing wrong with saying to God, God, thank you for that. It seems ironic that the strongest Christians are the first ones who recognize their weakness. As Paul said, when I'm weak, yeah. when I'm strong. And with spiritual maturity comes a better focus on what we still lack. Yeah. And I think that's a very important thing. About it's very true. Time. You know, class, even Paul himself identifies as one that is strong. He includes himself in the we, the W-E, the, the we word. When he says, we who are strong, note the verb ought. The word ought. It's a verb, folks, that right there is a very, very strong word, we ought. Folks, the word means, it speaks of a strong moral spiritual obligation, something that we must do. Uh, it speaks of a financial liability, as a matter of fact, that you must pay off a debt to someone. What did we say that we were in debt to? What debt do we pay? Love. We are in debt to each other through love. So, folks, and, and Paul is saying, we, we who are strong, have a spiritual, we have a moral obligation before God to do something. It's incumbent upon us, folks. It's laid at our feet. It's laid upon our shoulders to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. I heard Dr. Paul Faulkner said, you got your order. And you got your wanter. Yeah. Your order is what you ought to do, and your wanter is what you want to do. You need to let your order speak you louder than your, your wanter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, real technical using psychological terms. The idea that's being put forth here, we know that they're weaker brothers. We can't just stand by idly and say, just let them do whatever, or just let them struggle, let them suffer, let them be wrong, let them live in their weakness. We're not to do that. We're not to also, we're not to distance ourselves from them. I've seen this in the church, and it saddens me sometimes how we will withdraw into our own little holy huddles with just the strong. There's weak brothers, and we'll get our strong brothers together and we'll kind of huddle together and talk about them. We're actually to bear the weaknesses of those who are weak. Well, I was just going to say, Paul wrote this to be prepared to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they could think, I would think that would cause them to look for those that are weaker than they are. Yeah. 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 As we've said in this class, you may be strong in one aspect of the faith and weak in another. The word bear, B-E-A-R. Well, that's a word that's really worth talking about. Because it literally means to pick up something that's very heavy and carry it. I was thinking about this word and where it's found. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 27 it's used, the word is used when Jesus says to carry your cross. In Luke 7, 14, it's used to have coffin bearers at a funeral who would carry uh, the dead body in the funeral proceeding. And beyond all that, it really means to support and to help. You're basically getting into the harness and under the load of something of those who are weak and not just standing by idly criticizing them. Now, folks, listen, when Paul here speaks of weaknesses, it's in a plural form. Let me say that again. When Paul here is speaking of weaknesses, it's in a plural form. So it's multiple weaknesses of those who are without strength. They are weak 
at multiple different levels. It's the only time, folks, that this word is used in the whole New Testament. And Paul uses it right here, right now. So you might ask, what are they weak in? Well, considering the context of Romans chapter 14 and, and these two chapters being tied closer together, I don't think that you can count out the idea that they're weak in knowledge, weak in doctrine. Maybe they're just not well taught at this point. Maybe they're new to the Christian faith and they haven't been under the teaching and preaching of the word of God long enough for them to acquire the the truths that they need in order to, to mature, or they maybe they've been a believer for a few years, but like I said, maybe they're still wearing spiritual diapers. I mean, they maybe they've been under such weak teaching and preaching of the word of God, it's like they're still in the nursery right, uh, nursery uh, class, so to speak. So, folks, regardless of how they've arrived at these weaknesses that they have, we who are strong are to bear under the load with them. Now, as Jonathan said a few minutes ago, that does not mean that we're just to ignore their weaknesses. That doesn't mean that we are to coddle to their weaknesses. No, we are to help nurture them, encourage them, teach them, and bring them along in the faith. We are not to simply tolerate the weaker brother or to put up with them. That's not what Paul was saying here. What he's saying instead is our shoulders must be under their weakness and we should help hold them up as they continue to learn the truth. I've seen this done with people that are swimming. Your stronger swimmers gets underneath them and helps hold them up as they're learning how to swim. Folks, it's the same idea as we have here. We who are strong goes underneath them and helps hold them up by encouraging them and teaching them, not pushing them away, not making fun of them, not ridiculing them, not beating them down, but nurturing them and helping them along as they are taking their spiritual steps in the body of Christ. Exodus 17, you may remember this story. Uh, Exodus 17, 12 through 14. Moses' hands were heavy. Aaron and Hur took a stone, put it under him and sat on it. And what did Aaron and Hur do in that moment for Moses? They supported his arms. They got up underneath them, right? And they supported him. I, I love that imagery. Um, the victory they had that day um, was in due fact to the fact that Aaron and her did what they did. Uh, this is not in our notes, but Cliff and I talked about this earlier today. I know we have a lot of different translations that people use, but if you notice in verse one, the New American Standard uses the word weaknesses, right? Weak. All right, some of you that have a different translation, what words do you have? Do you have a NIV or an ESV? All right. Failings. Um, I think uh, what, what? Carl, you got the King James. New King James says scruples of the Scruples. Week. My old one says infirmities. Infirmities, yeah, there you go. There you go. Now we're there. Isn't scruples kind of the opposite of faith? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about. This is something I brought up to Cliff, and excuse me if I misspelled infirmities because I can't even remember how to spell it right off the All right. Now, the Greek word that is translated here, I... I don't know what the, the translators were thinking, but I can tell you what I imagine they were thinking is 
They wanted in the reading, like for the American standard, it would have, they would have, if they would have kept the same way, it would have been weaknesses of the weak. Notice they, they said what uh, in the New American Standard? Weaknesses of those who are without strength. Um, I am a person who likes things to be as close to the Greek as possible. So when I look at this, the word that is most accurate to the Greek is weaknesses. It's most literal. I don't think failings is a good word at all to use in this situation. And I'll tell you why. When we think of the word failings, what do we think? We think of sin. We think of somebody who is messing up. Somebody that they're they're failing because they're not doing it right. That's not what he's been uh, telling us over the last chapter. He's not been saying that these people are are, are inherently sinning, right? Uh, he, he hasn't put it like that. Um, I think the two words here that I think are best it is weaknesses and scruples. Why? Because chapter 14 deals with a lot of scruples, things that are convictions for people. Um, they're not black and white. There's a little bit of uh, uh, things in there that they're still struggling with. And infirmities, the reason I, I've told Cliff today reason that word kind of bothers me is when I think of infirmities, I think of sickness. That's the way we kind of in the South, uh, remember the church, they have an infirmity. You would think of person born blind or, you know, some other situation. So that word weaknesses, I think for me personally, speaks more to this uh, context. These are people who are weak in a specific area uh, and they have room to grow. All right. Um, at the end of verse one, Paul adds, and not just what? Please ourselves. That's the easiest thing uh, in this world to do is please yourself. I mean, we love to please ourselves. That's easy. The challenging thing is to be self-disciplined. The challenge is reeling back our words. The challenge is toning down our attitude. The challenge is bearing with the weaker brother until he can get to the point where he can see things more clearly. That's more of a challenge than just simply pleasing yourself. And it reminds me so much of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, where Paul says what? Bear one another burdens and thereby fulfill the law of what? The law of Christ. We fulfill the law of Christ, folks, by bearing the burdens of others. You do not have to walk this alone. You do not have to carry this alone. So, class, if there are Christians around us, who are not yet where they should be in the growth of their Lord and Savior and the wisdom and knowledge of this book. What are we to do? Ignore their weaknesses? No, absolutely not. Cuddle their weaknesses? No, not by a long shot. Accept them as being weak and never, ever, Ever let them stay there, work with them, help them, and try to help them mat mature. Are we to be put out with them? No, we're not. Are we to criticize them, gossip about them, write something about them on Facebook? No, no, we're to lift them up. As a matter of fact, when we are lifting them up, maybe it'd be best if we ourselves would, would lower ourselves down to our knees as we lift them up in prayer and keep them alone. We don't want them to walk away from the church, folks. And that, that's the easiest thing we can do as Christians to drive other Christians away by doing that. Take them along. Bring them along and help their weaknesses 
by converting their weaknesses into their strengths that will come in time. All right. Any uh, questions or comments here before we close up tonight? See what I've been thinking about as we're going through this last little bit of it is kind of like what you see in your typical classroom as well with a student who is struggling in one area of a particular subject. You don't see their their teacher, their professor going around and completely ignoring that student. You see them going directly to them, seeing what what their what the challenge is for that student and helping that student try to understand via various ways about that about that topic so that they're not the ones that are holding or being held back because of one thing that they don't quite understand the way that I was taught before. It's a similar thing here. Whenever I was teaching at ITT Technical Institute, the classes that I was teaching were very de de demanding. They were very high tech. And we had some students that they got it. We had some other students that looked at that deer in the headlight look. And it was amazing to me to see those that got it would migrate to those with the headlight look and then help almost tutor them to bring them along to where that they would be ready whenever we move forward so that they could move forward. Folks, that's exactly what we're talking about as Christians here. Yeah, and a good teacher takes joy in seeing the development of a student when they go from a weakness to a strength. Yes. A good teacher takes joy in that. I think we as Christians should take joy when we help uh, someone who's weak uh, in, in some area of their faith and we abide with them and help strengthen them and, and see their progress. We should uh, have joy in that as well. Any other questions or comments before we close up tonight? The battle, no one left behind. I like that. Shoulder to shoulder, marching together, making sure no one is, is left in the dark. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for each and every person, each and every soul that's represented here in this room tonight as we have gathered and studied your word together. For those who have joined us online or those who will happen across this video at some point, Father, and, and study this with us. Father, I pray that each and every person will have received your word and its truth and find a way that we may grow in our understanding of your will for our lives individually and collectively as your church. Father, we pray as we know your son prayed in the garden that we may be seen as one, that when this world looks at the Waters Road Church of Christ, they see a group of brothers and sisters who dwell together in harmony. And most importantly, they see people who love one another, who exemplify the nature of Christ in our dealings with one another, that are patient and long-suffering with each other. I know, Father, when I think of what it may be like for someone in the world, that's the kind of place I want to be, a place where people are patient and long-suffering and loving and caring with each other because, Father, we know we fulfill your will in its greatest form when we treat each other with that grace. So, Father, to help us take the lessons from tonight, put it into our lives. Father, help us as we go forth from here tonight, as we continue our week service in your kingdom and going through the other faculties of our lives that we may shine brightly as an example of your son and our dealings with those who are not yet Christians, whether it be in our workplace or in our school or in a grocery store or out on the highway. Father, just help us to be consistent in our faith outside of these four walls. Father, we thank you once again for the gift of your son, Jesus. And the remarkable hope that we have tonight because of the victory over sin that he made possible through his death, his resurrection. Father, again, forgive us of our sins and the falls that we have along the way, our weaknesses. 
Help us to bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.